Hello everyone, glad to be back. Today is 19th of September, now it's 11 o'clock in the morning Moscow time. I'm Levan Gudadze and this is my first update for the day in which I will share all the main news that are making headlines in Russian media outlets and Russian language pages on different internet platforms. There are quite a few very significant developments and news that I'd like to share with you for this moment. But before I start, let me uh, say thank to all of you for your attention and uh, support on daily basis uh, really but especially uh, yesterday because uh, you know all of us do have uh, ups and downs and uh, yesterday day before yesterday i was little depressed and uh, and uh, your kind words and support definitely boost my spirit so thank you thank you very much of course, I will try to continue work on these channels as, as long as uh, it takes to, to make this, this project successful. If, if, it's, if it's even possible, no one knows uh, what is waiting us in the future, but I will definitely try. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you are wonderful, wonderful community, uh, wonderful people. Thank you. And that's been said. That's been said. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about news now. And uh, I will start with a short summary of the situation in the battlefield. Today is one of those days when we have more information about this conflict uh, from fields of politics, not necessarily from the fields of uh, battles. But uh, there still are some some changes on line of contact and. Uh, I will report about it now. First of all, about night strike that Russian armed forces conducted on military and logistical infrastructure of uh, Kyiv regime. And I did share on my Telegram information about it. So according to reports from a number of sources, last night the Russian armed forces launched missile and drone attacks on the military and logistical infrastructure of Kyiv regime throughout Ukraine, including the directions of Kharkov, Dnipropetrovsk, Khmelnytsky, Krivoy Rok, Kherson, Nikolaev, Odessa region and uh, Lvov. And by the way, I also share uh, pictures of some consequences of uh, Russian strikes on logistical and military infrastructure in Lvov. These pictures are from Lvov. If you want to see in details, you can check my telegram. So Russian side is uh, actively, actively conducting this um, strikes to basically neutralize uh, first of all logistical logistical lines of ukrainian forces but also of course uh, military military infrastructure now let's talk about some details about front lines so kharkov region or not kharkov but kherson region on the southern sectors of the front line no significant changes no significant changes artillery duels between the sites and local scale skirmishes, reckon operations, and constant fight for control over the small islands on the Dnieper River and um, delta of this river. No significant changes uh, uh, on this sector. When it comes to uh, Zaporozhye and South Donetsk direction, also uh, no significant changes. Ukrainian side is continuing to um, concentrate its forces in Orekhov bridgehead. For the last several days, we did not see uh, more or less significant attempts from Ukrainian forces to conduct offensive operations in the, in the directions of Novoprokopovka or Verbovar. They are mainly concentrated on uh, on uh, sending more and more uh, reinforcements in this direction, I guess in preparation of second wave of counteroffensive. And uh, same goes, same goes for South Donetsk direction. No significant changes. Uh, we, I can call situation on these uh, two sectors, on this land bridge between Crimea and uh, mainland Russia, as a deadlock or operational pause. Even though uh, I think it's uh, highly likely that uh, in next uh, several weeks, maximum, before rainy season begins, uh, Kiev will launch uh, or at least try to launch second wave of counteroffensive. And simultaneously, by the way, we may see. Uh, attempt from Ukrainian forces to mass cross the Dnipr river in Kherson direction, you know, on Kherson sector. When it comes to Donetsk direction, southern flank of Donetsk sector is uh, 
not did not uh, um, we did not had reports uh, about significant changes when it comes to southern flank of Donetsk sector, but on the northern on the northern flank uh, in uh, close vicinity from Bakhmut on Bakhmut flanks uh, main uh, main hotspots are of course uh, Andreevka and Klishevka nowadays and uh, well. I did report. I did report that Ukrainian side was uh, sharing videos about uh, Ukrainian forces in these two settlements. Later on, yesterday, we had some reports that Russian side conducted uh, counteroffensives in this in these uh, directions. And today, by the way, uh, we have a statement from uh, Denis Pushilin, head of uh, DPR and uh, Donetsk People's Republic, and he said that basically Ukrainian side is trying to establish some uh, some uh, foothold in uh, these two settlements on the southern flank of Bakhmut but uh, they are not really successful in doing so and uh, while while uh, while receiving heavy heavy losses both in uh, Andreevka and in Klishevka and according to Denis Pushilin these two settlements right now are in the gray zone when no one side basically has uh, full control over the settlements and a few days ago i did share in one of the updates uh, video uh, footage from andreevka if you remember it's almost empty field it's a tiny village and uh, basically there is no single building that's standing uh, village is basically wiped out from face of the earth as a result of uh, immensely heavy fight and uh, uh, and uh, I don't think uh, it's uh, even feasible to establish a uh, foothold or stronghold in, in, in Klishevka or Andreevka because there's, there is nothing to hold on to. It's like empty fields, really, just the ruins. So I guess uh, assumption of Denis Pushilin is absolutely, absolutely correct. And both settlements, Andreevka and Klishevka, are in grey zone. And by the way, this pro-Ukrainian map even forced to acknowledge this. And they, they did put these settlements in the gray zone. And when it comes to northern sectors, uh, no, no, the northern flanks of Bakhmut, no significant changes. Initiative is in, in Russian side. And uh, for quite a while, for quite a while, uh, for, for at least uh, three, four weeks now, we did not see even more or less significant attempts from um, Ukrainian side to conduct local scale offensive operations. Although, some uh, sources do report that Ukrainian side is concentrating forces uh, on the northern side of Bakhmut, uh, possibly to conduct offensive operations in direction of Solidar, maybe even Krasnaya Gara. But right now, situation is deadlock, no significant changes whatsoever. And when it comes to northern sectors of the front line, main uh, usual story, artillery duels between the sides local scale skirmishes and of course drone wars all along the front line from northern sectors up to southern sectors uh, when it comes to uh, areas from uh, seversk let's say up to kupiansk as i said many times before only question is when russian side will green light when moscow or defense ministry will green light large-scale offensive operation will it happen uh, this autumn or it will this large-scale uh, Russian offensive will take place uh, in the winter. I don't believe Ukrainian side has uh, even slight chance to regain initiative in the northern sectors. And this is it when it comes to short, when it comes to short uh, summary of the situation on the battlefield. If I may, I remind you once again that uh, there are several channels that do devote more time on de uh, to detailed analyze of situation on the battlefield. And uh, I do recommend this, uh, this, this channel. You can see links uh, under my videos uh, in the description box. And first of all, of course, I'm talking about military summary channel. I'm talking about uh, Defense Politics Asia, DPA War. And of course, uh, Alexander Mercurius, they on a daily basis uh, informing us about uh, situation on the front line uh, and uh, sharing very detailed uh, information and of course by the way new atlas a uh, great great channel also and many others you can see links uh, as i said on the description under this video in the description box 
now let's uh, now let's continue and uh, i did already spoke about statements of denis pushilin about klishevka and andreevka both settlements uh, basically are in a gray zone and uh, i don't think ukrainian side has enough uh, strength in, on the southern flank of uh, bakhmut to continue this local scale uh this local scale offensive operations and let's say cross uh, railway which is uh, basically bordering both these settlements this is by the way a railway line and uh, both settlements Klishevka and Andreevka are right next to this railway and uh, I, 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 I highly doubt that uh, uh, Ukrainian forces will even try to cross this uh, railway and continue on the local scale offensives but let's see time will time will tell as i said many times before uh, generals in in general staff of ukrainian forces have some obsession with bakhmut and they did sacrifice tens of thousands of uh, ukrainian soldiers during the battles for bakhmut and i would not be surprised uh, if they will continue uh, very same and uh, if they will uh, sacrifice additional uh, thousands and thousands of uh, Ukrainian soldiers by continuing this uh, local scale offensive operations. Anyway, let's continue. TASS News Agency is also reporting that uh, uh, Denis Pushilin, acting head of uh, acting head of uh, DPR, Donetsk People's Republic, also made statements about uh, possibility that Atakim's long-range missiles will be uh, delivered to Kyiv regime by us and pushilin said that from military standpoint these missiles uh, in strategic terms would not change uh, anything on the on the front line although of course uh, additional deliveries of weapons uh, will prolong this conflict that's uh, obvious stuff but if anyone in the western uh, elites or in the western media are thinking that this at attackums missile is gonna become a next one the weapons uh, they don't they don't. Russian air defense systems are quite effective to uh, shut down, to deal with the uh, Storm Shadow uh, cruise missiles, with Scalp cruise missiles, uh, and they will, with with the uh, uh, HIMARS multi-launch ro multi rocket systems uh, and their missiles. And by the way, attackers, if they will be delivered, also will be launched from uh, HIMARS system. So Russian air defense systems, uh, they know how to deal with these uh, weapons. And uh, of course, uh, this, this uh, missile is not going to become uh, any game changer. And same goes for uh, Taurus long-range cruise missiles uh, that are uh, produced by Germany. Even though for now we don't have any clear statements from Berlin uh, if uh, they will deliver these uh, missiles to Kyiv regime. But uh, I'm afraid once US will begin deliveries of attackums then uh, berlin basically will be forced to do the same and to uh, send uh, taurus cruise missiles to uh, zelensky and his associates i don't think berlin will uh, dare to say no to washington it's, it's not happening unfortunately uh, modern germany is uh, absolute colony of the washington and uh, has no say in in no uh, in in no uh, topic really no matter it's internal topic or foreign policy it's just a colony by the way which is uh, i guess uh, very nerve-breaking and uh, uh, frustrating for citizens of germany citizens that do realize uh, situation of, uh, of their country let's continue now and task news agency is reporting that According to statements from Russian Defense Ministry, during the previous missile and drone strikes on logistical and military infrastructure of uh, Kyiv regime, uh, uh, Russian side targeted the warehouses where Storm Shadow, Storm Shadow cruise missiles were stored, and also shells with uh, depleted uh, uranium. So this is quite uh, this is quite uh, important uh, stuff. Uh, recently, Russian uh, Russian forces did become uh, quite active when it comes to basically uh, destroying military infrastructure of uh, 
Ukrainian forces deep inside Ukraine and I guess uh, during the one of the strikes uh, warehouses were targeted where uh, Kiev was storing the storm shadow missiles and uh, shells with depleted uranium I would not be surprised if in coming days we will see some uh, reports about increase of uh, increase of some uh, uh, radio uh, activity in certain areas of uh, Ukraine let's see let's see because of destruction of these uh, shells with depleted uranium um, and by the way who to blame for that of course United Kingdom's government and US government because these two countries are delivering shells with depleted uranium to um, key regime Although U.S. officially did not say that they already did deliver. But usually what happens is that once they announce the deliveries of uh, any type of weapons, those weapons already are on the, on the ground. So I guess uh, U.S. already did send uh, shells with depleted uranium to uh, Ukraine. But let's, uh, let's continue. RIA Novosti is reporting that, um, well, according to New York Times, investigation um, uh, according to new york times investigation uh, a missile strike on konstantinovka uh, several weeks ago during the which uh, 16 civilians died 16 civilians died and uh, 33 was uh, uh, injured this strike was conducted by ukrainian side and according to new york times a book air defense systems missile uh, lost orientation and basically struck Konstantinovka well uh, uh, no surprises for for me and uh, I guess for uh, f for you for our community because uh, very first day I did a report about findings of uh, uh, Russian investigative uh, journalists and military experts that they uh, stated straight away basically by analyzing information, video footage uh, from the uh, from the accident area of accident that uh, this missile uh, struck Konstantinovka from western side, and western side was controlled and still are controlled by uh, Ukraine Ukrainian forces. So it was uh, clear from straight away that it was uh, Ukrainian side that conducted this strike, and this happened. Uh, exactly when uh, head of uh, u.s state department anthony blinking was in kiev and that's why i think it was no mistake it was no mistake it was a deliberate terrorist attack of uh, uh, key regime on its own citizens just to have a topic to talk about during the during the uh, visit of uh, anthony blinking into ukraine and even though New York Times is talking about book missile, uh, I did see reports on Russian uh, Telegram uh, channels uh, about possibility that harm missile was uh, used during this strike. But anyway, anyway, fact itself that uh, U.S. one of the U.S. mainstream uh, media outlets, one of the biggest names in U.S. so-called media, because all of them are propaganda outlets basically at this point. The fact itself that New York Times is writing about it definitely indicates that something is not uh, uh, going perfectly well in relationships between the uh, key regime and Washington. And uh, by the way, right now Zelensky is in in US and he will have a meeting with Biden. So uh, timing is very important and I, gu I guess uh, this article uh, was published on New York Times to pressurize Zelensky for uh, for whatever reasons we will found, find out probably later on what Washington exactly wants from uh, from Zelensky let's uh, let's continue some reports uh, suggesting that Washington may pressure Zelensky to conduct peace negotiations uh, but but uh, I'm not quite sure about that because uh, Washington don't really need to pressure Zelensky. Uh, Zelensky is their puppet and has no say. 
So something else is uh, going on, uh, as I understand. And um, as I said many times before, my understanding is that uh, my understanding is that once this conflict will end, Ukraine will be divided between uh, Russia and the NATO member states that are bordering Ukraine. And uh, I will give 99% to possibility that there will be no more Ukraine on political map after this um, conflict. So I guess uh, maybe exactly the opposite will take place in, in Washington and Zelensky and his associates will be pressurized to continue this uh, suicidal counteroffensive, to continue this, um, this uh, conflict and to basically sacrifice all uh, military age or majority of military age uh, men of uh, Ukraine so that when NATO member states and uh, with the leading of Poland will try to establish control over the western regions of this failed state they will receive as minimal resistance as possible but anyway time will time will tell but let's uh, let's continue and this is quite uh, interesting uh, news also RT is reporting that Zelensky's uh, home was uh, seized in Crimea and uh, authorities in Crimean Peninsula, Crimean Autonomous Republic now are uh, discussing possibility to open Nazi, anti-Nazi museum, museum in, um, in Zelensky's uh, home, which will be quite, quite uh, understandable move, quite understandable move and uh, well, uh, let's see let's see but uh, Zelensky uh, definitely will be associated with uh, Ukrainian Nazis and the uh, crimes that they did committed uh, forever now and as news agency is reporting that uh, Ukraine's um, government did uh, release from uh, duty six deputies of uh, defense minister of Ukraine, among them infamous Anna Maliar, that has uh, unbelievable fantasy. All of you probably are familiar with this uh, individual. She was uh, stating for a long time, by the way, she was making such a crazy statements that I mean, uh, some uh, some writers in Hollywood uh, will probably be jealous of. Uh, that's how how huge fantasy this uh, animal has. But anyway, let's uh, let's continue. Um, I just wanted to share with you this information because because of this person, animal this uh, uh, this dreamer. But anyway, let's continue. Task news agency is reporting that according to Bloomberg's uh, information. EU will uh, EU will introduce uh, 12 anti-Russian packet of sanctions on uh, on uh, beginning on the first days of uh, October. Well, uh, uh, bureaucrats in Brussels aren't stopping, isn't it? They are. They need to basically uh, prove constantly how anti-Russian and how Russophobic they are. And uh, well, it's interesting what uh, what will be included in this 12th packet, package of anti-Russian sanctions. What they gonna ban now? Air from uh, Russia? <laughs> what? But according to Bloomberg, by the way, some EU member states uh, extremely russophobic ones i guess we are talking about baltic states and uh, poland first of all are demanding from brussels uh, in this 12 sanction packet to be included uh, lng imports from russia and uh, and uh, and uh, pro products of russian it sector well Spain, France, uh, Denmark, many other countries going to be not happy if uh, such a decision will be made because uh, they are quite dependent on Russian uh, LNG 
But let's see. Let's see. Uh, EU bureaucrats already did uh, damage EU's economy. So much so that uh, nothing can be uh, excluded at this point. They can ban export of uh, import of Russian LNG. Also, let's see how Madrid, for example, uh, will react on that. Because Russia is the second biggest uh, uh, LNG exporter for uh, for Russia, Spain is the second biggest uh, buyer of LNG, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. First is, now, is China, and second is Spain. So let's see if Spain will uh, say no to import Russian liquefied gas. But anyway, let's continue. Rianost is reporting that Slovakia, Poland, and Hungary... Uh, Slovakia, Poland, and Hungary refused, basically, to obey... Uh, Brussels and to lift a uh, ban on uh, import of Ukrainian grain and well this struggle between uh, Eastern Euro European states uh, mainly Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Bulgaria if the struggle of those states with Brussels uh, will, uh, will, will continue uh, will continue during uh, before next harvesting season but at least for now at least for now it seems like uh, budapest warsaw and uh, leadership of slovakia are quite uh, determined to keep this ban on uh, not just on uh, ukrainian grain by the way grain imports but when it comes to hungary if i'm not mistaken hungary ban also imports of some 24 uh, other uh, products of uh, Ukraine's agricultural uh, sector. But anyway, let's continue. RT is reporting that uh, Trudeau, by the way, yesterday did made a quite uh, quite serious statements. Uh, quite serious statements uh, against India, and basically. Uh, Trudeau blame India, India's uh, secret services, and India's government of killing uh, killing uh, Sikh leader Sikh leader in uh, in Canada and uh, and this murder took place uh, early summer if i'm not mistaken uh, Hardeep Singh Nijar that's the name of person that was uh, killed and he is uh, as i understand religious uh, local religious leader with some influence in India also, and of course, New Delhi uh, respond to this statement and uh, basically denied any involvement, any involvement uh, in this uh, in this story. And uh, more than that, India made decision to uh, declare persona non grata one of the high-ranking uh, diplomats of Canada that are uh, staff of uh, Canadian Embassy in India. And this was, by the way, also done in response to pretty much similar move from, uh, from Canada. And, uh, well, uh, what you're going to say, relationships between two sides are deteriorating quite significantly. I'm not really uh, well informed about uh, all, this, uh, all this issue. Uh, our members, our members uh, from India or from Sikh community can can share information about it. Uh, it it will be interesting to know better what is going on. But uh, well, uh, when it comes to secret services, by the way, we all know what the secret services do. So if uh, Indian secret services will was involved in this uh, uh, story, I don't think anybody would be surprised. If uh, India's uh, secret services uh, take this person as a threat to India, and I would not be surprised if uh, India has nothing to do with this uh, case, because uh, current leadership of India, current leadership of India is under significant pressure for from uh, Western so-called elites. By the way, for many reasons, they definitely don't like Modi and his government. And one of the reasons, uh, of course, can be India's uh, position when it comes to relationships with Russia.
So there is many reasons why Canada can be used by Western so-called elites to uh, escalate with India and put some pressure on Modi's government. And maybe exactly this is happening. Who knows, by the way? Who knows? From Western elites, from Western so-called elites, we should expect just, just about everything. They are, you know... Let's continue. TAS News Agency is reporting that Pakistan denied the uh, informations uh, that are circulating in media that they are uh, supplying weapons uh, to Kiev regime in exchange of uh, improving relationships with the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and by the way, according to these informations that are circulating in the internet, uh, uh, Islamabad already did deliver uh, shells to Kiev regime for $900 million dollars which is a huge amount, isn't it? Which is huge amount. If this is the truth, then uh, we are talking about tens of thousands of shells, maybe hundreds of thousands of shells. And uh, I would not be surprised if this is uh, if this is true, because current leadership of Pakistan definitely is under heavy influence of Washington. And uh, well, if there were if Washington demanded this this kind of steps from uh, Islamabad, it's quite possible that they did obey uh, orders. If uh, Imran Khan was in, in government, there will be no issue, I guess, because uh, Imran Khan will uh, take a more neutral position. Position, I'm quite sure about it. But current leadership of Pakistan definitely are under complete control of Washington. And I don't think they have even... Uh, say in this matter they are just receiving orders and they are acting by these orders which is quite unfortunate by the way uh, not just uh, because it damages relationships between russia and pakistan but also because it damages uh, relationships between pakistan and china and china is the main economical partner for uh, strategic partner for for pakistan in many in many many uh, directions including security by the way but current leadership of Pakistan seems like don't really care about Pakistani security. All they care is to obey orders of their Western masters, and that's it. But anyway, let's continue. TAS News Agency is reporting that US and Iran did conducted exchange of prisoners. So both sides uh, freed five prisoners. Uh, uh, Iran uh, set free five uh, US citizens, and the uh, US that did exactly the same, set free five Iranian citizens. Exchange already did talk uh, place, which is a good step towards uh, improving relationships between Iran and the USA. But very same time, by the way, US, as this uh, exchange is happening, very same time US is exp uh, uh, putting on Iran additional sanctions. And uh, on Iran Iranian media, by the way, not just Iranian government or officials, but on Iranian media and after this uh, so-called elites in the US will come out and and start talking about you know uh, basic human rights uh, freedom of speech and so on they are so pathetic by the way it's unbelievable but let's uh, let's continue uh, next topic is uh, situation in Georgia by the way, the next topic is situation in Georgia. Yesterday I did report the Georgian secret services did made a statement that uh, some groups that are located in Georgia and outside of Georgia are planning uh, to destabilize country from October to December uh, time period and eventually to conduct uh, uh, armed coup or regime change and uh, according to georgia's uh, according to georgia's uh, secret service leading this uh, operation let's say deputy former deputy of uh, georgia's internal ministry of internal affairs and current deputy of ukraine's military intelligence deputy of budanov by the way under 
name of uh, Lord Kipanidze, Georgi Lord Kipanidze, if I'm not mistaken. Let me find it, man. Georgi Lord Kipanidze, yes. And by the way, Ukraine did respond on these uh, statements from Tbilisi and, uh, well, they did accuse Georgia, Georgian government, Ukraine's uh, spokesperson of Ukraine's foreign ministry did accuse Georgia, current Georgian government, of uh, escalating with Ukraine when, by the way, al allegations of Georgian secret services are very serious, very serious. And this person, Georgi Rodkipanidze, has means, by the way, to conduct some secret of operations, military operations, because he is a deputy of Ukraine's military intelligence. And according to Georgia's secret services, in this uh, plan also are participating uh, fighters of so-called Georgian Legion that are uh, fighting alongside Ukrainian neo-Nazis for a while, by the way, for, for years and years. And this organization, this uh, Georgian Legion, is also operating under umbrella of uh, Ukraine's military intelligence. And uh, Mamuka Mamulashvili, this person, is uh, formerly leader of that Georgian Legion. And by the way, we should remember that uh, in 2014, there are many statements made by former officials uh, that uh, uh, during the uh, milit during the uh, coup in in Ukraine in 2014, snipers that was uh, uh, firing in direction of uh, uh, security forces and in direction of uh, civilians, those fighters were from Georgia, exactly from from, uh, and and then those fighters become part of Georgian Legion, so they are somewhat associated with this uh, Georgian Legion. So they, these are in uh, straight up murderers, by the way, in Georgian Legion. And uh, as I said, they are operating under umbrella of uh, Ukraine's uh, military intelligence. And I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely taking seriously allegations of Georgian Secret Services towards this organization, this terrorist group, basically, Georgian Legion, their fighters, and also towards uh, Ukraine's military intelligence and the deputy of that, uh, deputy of the head of that uh, structure, uh, Georgi, whatever his name is, that criminal man, Lord Kipanidze. So let's see how will situation uh, develop between uh, between uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine further, and what steps Georgia will take to make sure that there will be no disturbances in Georgia. Because this is a very serious stuff, by the way, very serious stuff. But especially if you take in account that Ukraine's uh, military intelligence is operating under the umbrella of CIA, they are controlled by CIA, by the way, and Budanov, head of. Uh, military uh, intelligence of Ukraine is a CIA's asset. And I said many times before that uh, uh, Biden's administration and the Western elites, so-called elites in general, are very not happy with current Georgian leadership because they are not willing to sacrifice Georgia for geopolitical interests of these so-called Western elites, like Ukraine did, like Ukrainian so-called elites did. Because Washington and the uh, Western uh, ruling class wants uh, Georgia to be sacrificed and to become second uh, front against Russia, which is not happening and uh, hopefully will not happen. Let's hope current uh, government of Georgia will deal with these very serious uh, risks um, effectively and will secure Georgian citizens and Georgia itself. But let's uh, continue, by the way, I think uh, to devote a little more time about uh, the, to this topic uh, tomorrow during the live stream. Uh, hopefully you will find it interesting and same time I will devote uh, yes, uh, tomorrow's live stream uh, also to situation in the Southern Caucasus region in general because uh, very interesting developments are taking place, not just in Georgia, by the way, but also when it comes to relationships between Armenia and Azerbaijan, also uh, certain moves from Iran, Turkey, Russia, so uh, hopefully it will be interesting. And uh, well, let's uh, 
let's continue now and uh, <coughs> excuse me Ria Novosti is reporting that Putin did uh, sign a decree about uh, digital passport uh, this is quite interesting uh, also by the way and from now on from now on uh, uh, digital versions of russian uh, id documents from uh, gosuslugi service gosuslugi by the way is uh, it's a uh, internet service that russian government uh, is providing to citizens uh, almost everyone in russia has an uh, account on gosuslugi uh, me not be an exception i also and uh, well this is very comfortable way by the way to to uh, communicate with the uh, state institutions whenever you 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 need to uh, do something for example when i registered myself as a self employee i did it through uh, gosuslugi when i had to change my passport when i get 45 uh, um, i also used uh, gosuslugi so it's very comfortable stuff by the way i don't know if you have something like that in in your country but uh, it, it it does operates in russia this system and it's uh, truly very very comfortable uh, uh, to 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 operate and this is one of the moves by the way that russian government conducted to uh to tackle corruption also uh so very successful project i will say this this goes to slugi and uh, from now on from now on you don't have to carry with you passport all all you need you, you know is to open ID on your phone through Gosuslugi and uh, that's supposed to be enough which is also comfortable because uh, for example whenever I go to Moscow and by the way I was planning to uh, go to Moscow today for example and make this update from Moscow but uh, it did not work out uh, unfortunately but I will I will definitely try to do video this uh, walk and talk type of video from Moscow uh, they they day after tomorrow maybe uh, let's see let's see because tomorrow i have uh, this live stream and i have to be uh, at home but anyway whenever i am I'm, I'm going to moscow i have with me my passport uh, and uh, this way this way uh, if uh, i can show uh, my id from gosuslugi and if, if if that's enough then well great some people may don't like this digitization of uh, uh, this increased this digitization of, of uh, elements in our life but uh, that's uh, I guess inevitable inevitable stuff uh, so let's uh, let's continue uh, and RT is reporting that Russia has recovered from sanctions pressure that was made uh, this statement was made by Putin, by the way, and uh, let me read several sentences. Russia's GDP has uh, once again attained the level it had uh, prior, prior to uh, in, impose. Ah, before uh, the sanctions were imposed by Western so called elites, uh, President Vladimir Putin said on Monday at the government meeting on the draft federal budget 2024-2026 uh, in general we can say that the recovery stage of the russian economy has been completed we have uh, withstood absolutely unprecedented external pressure the sanctions onslaught uh, of uh, some ruling elites in the so-called uh, western bloc putin said and he added that uh, russia's gross domestic product had now reached level it had in 2021 which is uh, well on its own quite uh, quite something isn't it if you take in account exactly this uh, this pressure from the west and the uh, sanctions war and uh, putin noted that in april gdp growth was uh, forecast to be 1.2 percent but in fact we have already sir surpassed this uh, target and by the end of the year gdp growth will may reach the level of 2.5 or even 2.8 percent yes 
yes that's absolutely correct and uh, well once again uh, once again uh, i should uh, notice that um, well we may agree or disagree on, on some policies of economical block of russian government but they did some uh, astonishing job by the way to 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 keep russian economy uh, in in good shape by the way strong enough that it it's it, it can withstand such a pressure so uh, let's uh, let's continue iconic u.s art is also reporting that iconic u.s clothing brands may return to russia and this this time we are talking about tommy hilfiger and kelvin klein these brands uh, left Russia because of the Western sanctions and pressure, and that they are looking ways, looking for ways now to uh, return to Russian um, market, and they will participate, as I understand, in parallel import uh, that was introduced by Russian uh, Russian side, and uh, shops that these uh, brands had in Russia will probably reopen under under different name under different brand and this is by the way main way basically that western companies are taking now they are establishing new brands and they are selling their products under this uh, new brand and this way they basically are avoiding uh, western uh, western pressure and once again this information does confirms exactly what uh, Putin's statement was uh, about Russian economy is doing quite okay and that's why these these companies Western companies wants to return to this market or somehow hold on to their positions that they have here in Russia let's continue and RT is also reporting that Western companies made billions in Russia last year once again uh, information uh, proves what I just said. Well, let me read just one sentence. Uh, it will make situation much clearer. So, major Western brands, major Western brands uh, that decided to continue operating in the country in Russia, recorded over 18 billion in Russian profits in 2022. Quite a number, isn't it? 18 billion profits. So they were quite clever, these companies that made decision to remain in, in, in Russian economy. But not all Western companies uh, managed to withstand pressure and many did leave. And uh, well, for them, it's not going to be easy to come back to Russian market and uh, regain share on Russian market that they hold before. Let's, uh, let's continue. RT is reporting that Russia-US trade pledged to new law. And according to uh, this uh, article, trade turnover amounted to 277.3 million at the end of July. That figure is 11 times less than the one recorded in February 2022 and 13 times less than the amount for uh, July 2021 the year when us ranked fifth among russia's largest trading partners and well no surprises here by the way no surprises here trade uh, between russia and the uh, us between russia and the uh, eu member states did fail quite quite significantly and uh, well it will stay this way it will stay this way for uh, quite a while i guess until before some changes will be made in the so-called ruling class of the Western uh, bloc or Western world. Let's see. Let's see. And by the way, this is going to be last news for today's, uh, for today's update. Um, RIA Novost is reporting that export of uh, food, agricultural produce, is becoming a major major source of income for Russian federal budget. Uh, that was uh, stated by head of Russian uh, uh, customs services, Ruslan Davidov. And uh, together with uh, basically together with the uh, oil and gas exports, food uh, exports are becoming major source of income for Russian federal budget, which is um, 
which is great, of course, which is expectable. And uh, I believe it's only a matter of time when Russian food exports will become, uh, uh, will, with, with its uh, uh, amount of money, with the amount of money that it brings to Russian federal budget, will surpass Russian exports of uh, oil and uh, gas. Because Raj Russia has just uh, immense potential to become uh, uh, to become a major major breadbasket of for this uh, world, and Russia is on this path, by the way, definitely. And uh, maybe it will take five years, maybe ten years, fifteen years, but eventually, I'm quite sure uh, Russian food exports will bring to Russian budget significantly more than uh, oil and uh, gas. And this is it for now. This is it for now. Hopefully, hopefully you will find this um, update interesting. And if so, please uh, click that like button and leave some commentary about any topic you like. More likes and comments definitely increase increases my chances to reach wider audience and uh, for very same reason if you can please uh, share links to my videos or my channel with your friends on facebook telegram twitter or any other platform that you are active on and uh, if you think this channel is interesting informative and deserves to exist in this field of news and political commentary please consider to support with uh, small, with small donations through paypal buy me a coffee or by subscribing to my patreon page you will see links under this video in the description box or in the pinned comment this is it for now have a great day and take care